kill of the departed because he 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 left us uh, a little while ago and um I was approached by uh, his brother, Guy, not only his brother, his identical twin, uh, whether we might uh, commemorate uh, a very colourful, picaresque life at Cabaret Futura one night. And I thought, well, that's exactly why we're here. So uh, I'm not going to give any int introduction or indications of what we're about to see, except to introduce an interview with the late Simon Lane by Guy Lane. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Simon. I understand that, you know, interviews is something that you don't do often, so we feel uh, very privileged that you've graced the stage this evening. Um, so, one thing to touch upon, when did you die? It was actually on December the... I don't know, it's hazy. Tw uh, 28th, I think. 28th of December, at about 10 past nine is when I died. Okay, so, uh, so what was that like? I'd never done that before. Um, <laughs> So it was, a, it was a new experience for me. I suppose in some ways it was quite good, because I've been in hospital for a while. But obviously, clearly, I didn't really know. I've traveled a lot. I've been to quite a few different countries and stuff. So I wasn't really totally sure where I was headed. But um, yeah, it was an interesting trip. And um, the funeral? I mean, what was that like? I, I'm assuming there were tears, of course. Um, so, you know, I was quite pleased with the way the funeral played out. Um, it was at St. Barnes Church. It's actually a um, pretty good show. Um, good venue, good environment. And um, I, thought that I thought my brother did quite well, actually. Um, I don't know whether he chose exactly the right piece, but uh, anyway, he got up there and strutted his stuff a bit. Um, and actually, he chose a piece which I'd, uh, which I'd written. And he said it was actually remarkably... Apposite, apposite for a, a funeral. So um, I think he's probably right. Um, and I'll just read out a bit of it. It's entitled In Rio, which is where I lived for a while. I hadn't actually written this piece for my funeral, but I think, in a way, maybe, maybe I was thinking of my funeral when I, when I wrote it. In Rio de Janeiro, 2008, I'm in Rio de Janeiro. I came here to spend a month. That was seven years ago, almost to the day. No one ever says, I'm going to Rio de Janeiro for seven years, but people like to exclaim at parties, I came for a visit, and just how long it's been. Well, it doesn't feel long at all. This place is in my blood, and my blood is in this place, all over it, in fact. S excuse me when I reach for my glasses, because since I died, um, my eye shits. Eye shit? My eyesight. <laughs> Since I died, my eye shit's gone to something. <laughs> and also, the glasses that you get up there, it's like, they're a bit dodgy. Um, where was the book? Oh, yeah, sorry. I suppose I've had a big life, whatever that means making luck while tempting fate? Possibly. I'm 50 years old. I've used up time and I've too much, and I've too much time. All the time in the world. A day is an eternity. A life the simplest of epitaphs. I have a reflection of my own inflated modesty. An ambulant paradox surviving on love, red wine, blue sea, the patter of rain on my forehead, or a burst of sunshine as it lends shadow to a giant mango tree. A toucan squawks on a high branch taking flight all of a sudden so as to show off its scarlet tail feathers, the reddest red possible. A monkey robs a banana from the kitchen table and is chased out by a dog I've never seen before. A lizard the length of a pool cue rests immobile, poised on the terrace. Yet nothing really stops in this house on the side of a mountain whose peak, 
whose peak changes shape at the turn of the head. Nature will never need saving. She can look after herself. And me? My emotions have found a home in this place in order for my thoughts to take shape. I'm therefore, I think, and I think in one language, even if I speak right in others, the language I assume by default and which I use to satisfy my need to describe the world. Happily deluded by the impossibility of the task. English. The universal language of the alien. The necessity of creating fiction has ebbed for now. I've become more of a hapless witness than an instrument of my own projected imaginings. Propelled as always by the most curious curiosity. My guide. My tempter. Not the curiosity that killed the cat, rather the fascination of a busy soul in a busier orbit. As for cats, in Brazil they have seven, not nine lives, for a reason yet to be explained to me. Someone in London, whose drink of choice I forget, once said, we're the kind of people for whom the light at the end of the tunnel is the oncoming train. Well, I've been in tunnels, I've been caught in a shootout, I've seen bodies by the road, a parachutist fall into the sea, and I've felt myself dying, attended by nurses, smiles, syringes. I suppose I should be more careful, but then I'm not a cat. When it's time to die, the battery will run out, and the clock will stop. But it will still tell the truth, twice a day at least. I won't go quietly either. I'm hoping for light music in the background. I'm just a writer, but writing calms the nerves, offering an eye of a storm in which to observe life's tragedies, banalities, beauties. I'm calm as I write this, even in the sea. Even the sea through the window appears to have stopped now, while the sky is an even blue, unusual for this dot or spot at which the overheated landmass of South America often meets the air of more southern latitudes in a pointed line, like the noses of a gang about to have a fight over a girl or some money. Last night, the house shook, and flashes of lightning came down onto the favela nearby as if in response to all the bullets and red tracer fired off into the sky at a helicopter, or just for fun, dizzy compliment to carnival fireworks. Yes, pleasure should be taken seriously too, for seven days, seven years, seven lives, more even. Life is not short, not short at all, just the right length. Longer than a lizard, shorter than a silly dream, more like a piece of string, plucked from the cobbles of the street you happen to be on, suitable for wrapping any gift, large or small. Writing it all down is another question, any perception of truth being truly imperceptible within the greater sphere. As for the answer, I didn't stay on for seven years because I thought it was simply a good idea. I stayed on because all of a sudden, time came to a stop without so much as a whimper. Thanks. Well, that's a very beautiful piece, Simon. I'm sure you're very proud of that. And uh, you speak so fondly of your time in Rio, so... Uh it brings us on to the next point. I believe there was a, a mass in Rio, is that correct? There was actually. I had two funerals, which was quite good. Um, I was quite chuffed about that. Because uh, after the St. Bart's thing and the, uh, the gig at the, uh, the wake at the uh, Chelsea Arts Club, which was all right, uh, we then moved on to Rio, which was a, an interesting idea. And anyway, we had a mass, mass uh, funeral mass thing in uh, Rio, and uh, funny enough, my identical twin, Guy, he was there again, and he, but um, well, it wasn't that funny he was there, but um, he did the best he could. Uh, he got up at the sharp end, made a speech and stuff, and uh, half, of, half of the congregation didn't realize that I even had a twin brother, so it caused a bit of confusion, <laughs> as you can well imagine. Next question, please, madam. Yes, I imagine that's very confusing for everyone turning up. Um, but on to the write-ups. I mean, there were many obituaries written about you all over the world. Um, but there was one sort of that springs to mind, The Independent. Um, it was written by Adrian Dennett. How did you feel about that piece? I got more airtime after I died in this country than I've been seeking for my entire adult life. I got more column inches about two weeks after I died than I could have ever dreamed of. A moment, please. It's not often a dead guy gets the chance to answer his critics and particularly answer the uh, writer of his obituaries. Funnily enough, Adrian Dunner did actually a pretty good job. Here's a snippet. Um, I guess being quite vain and being a, you know, an artist and all that, um, some of this stuff actually appealed to me. Um, 
Simon Lane was one of those writers whose published oeuvre is only matched by the supreme fiction of their own existence, comma, the mystic resonance of their travels and tribulations, those who boldly spin the text of their own legend daily, or more likely nightly. Thanks a lot, Adrian. Um, it goes on. Um, well, obviously, uh, not obviously, but actually. Um, he was an English gentleman novelist in permanent exile, a self-described drinker with a writing problem. Um, <laughs> Then it got some stuff in here, which actually, I have to say, or have to, do I have to do this? Yeah, admit it's actually true. Um, unusual for a, a newspaper. Um, let's have a go. Um, this is actually slightly embarrassing. Have we got any French people here? No? We have one right here. <laughs> I, 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 know, I, know, I know Florence is here, but bear with me. I know Florence will understand. Um, forgive me others, um, but I can just quote it anyway. I didn't necessarily do this thing. I didn't do this at all. This is actually just a statement in this newspaper. His penchant for leaping on restaurant tables, all you frogs are collaborationists, was only matched by his taste for every sort of stimulant. Uh, yeah, it's broadly correct. Um, and then this bit, uh, attending a wedding, I seem to do vaguely remember this, attending a wedding in the south of France along with his wife, Lane soon, reali soon realized he was in love with the bride and cunningly befriended the groom. I think I remember those guys. Uh, the four of them got on so well that the couple invited Lane and his wife along on the honeymoon, whereupon he swiftly ran away with the newlywed, uh, eventually abandoning, abandon I can't even say it, abandoning her in Rome, having realized he was simply infatuated with the idea of stealing a bride. <laughs> Nearly right. Um, have we got time for any more? Oh, Richard, where are you? Time is Richard's gone home. <laughs> are we okay, good. More questions. Okay, um, so that must have been interesting. Um, that little adventure for you. Um, I believe you just had a you just had a memorial weekend in Paris. Um, I believe there's a mention of the Sansal piece here, which seems to be a big feature of the weekend. It's quite topical, uh, because, yeah, the weekend, when was that? Yesterday. Um, when you're dead, you kind of lose track of time. Uh, yesterday, yeah, we were all in Paris. Well, they didn't know I was there, but, well, they thought I was there, because uh, they were a pathetic uh, ashes thing, which my brother was walking, you know, walking around Paris with, you know, this little box, which was my cufflink box with a few of my ashes in it, which I thought was a bit ridiculous, but uh, never mind. Uh, so, so anyway, he got to this. Uh, I remember, I do remember actually. Uh, before before I died, it was actually last October or something. I said to my twin, I said, "Well, you can chuck some of my ashes in uh, San Sulpice Fountain." Um, I was just quite chuffed that he remembered that. Uh, but I noticed actually that uh, San Sulpice Fountain yesterday was the only fountain in Paris that didn't actually have any water. <laughs> but I was quite pleased the way in which my twin sort of uh, improvised on that one. Uh, he got, uh, he's a local cafe there, I don't know if you guys know that square, it's quite pretty, uh, Sansal Peace, the church there, and there's quite a nice cafe there. And um, Guy went to the cafe and got a carafe of water and then immediately pronounced it as holy water, you know, by virtue of the fact he did a bit of this, you know, like, um, so that became the holy water. And then he ordered a large pastis on the rocks, and he got my sort of cufflink box, got some of the um, ashes, stuck it in the, uh, in the glass, topped it up with water, and held some kind of quasi-religious ritual, um, and then chucked it into the uh, empty fountain. So next time you go to Paris, if you see, you know, um, what we call the, uh, the new cocktail, uh, the new cocktail which has been invented, it's going to be big. The saint piece, it's, it's a cocktail. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, Something actually which is also true, which I thought was a bit annoying, was I noticed that um, my twin, he had another sort of stash of ashes just in case he lost them or it was windy or something, or they went up his nose or something. And um, that was in a little black bag. It was like a sponge bag, you know, a cheap one from Boots. And uh, he asked Mick Kerr, one of my mates, or actually my best mate, to look after that bag. And he lost it. And... <laughs> 
so I noticed that then um, my twin, he went into the cafe and he said uh, to the patron, he said, um, have you seen any ashes? Or, <laughs> or rather, uh, est-ce que vous avez-vous le sac uh, plastique uh, noir? Est-ce que vous avez-vous ça, avez, avez monsieur le patron? Uh, ah oui, d'accord, il est ici. And he had it, you know, behind the bar, which is probably where it should uh, should remain. So should you should you go to that cafe on the corner there, uh, and you see a black uh, boots, toilet bag, or whatever it's called, sponge bags, right? Um, that's where some of I am, as it were. Thank you. Hold on. Well, I think that was lovely of your uh, of your twin brother Guy to come up with such a fantastic idea of how to uh, of how to get you into the fountain there. Um, so finally, the last question. It's a big one. Uh, it's about your one of your most amazing pieces of work, which was True Rouge, uh, collaboration with the Brazilian artist Tunga. Um, tell us a bit about that. True Rouge is a poem I wrote. I'm just going to read out because uh, I see Richard edg edging towards me, about to chunk me out. So. Okay, yeah, yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Mind you, I'm dead, so I don't give a fuck. I mean, you know, what's he gonna, what's he gonna do to me? Uh, you know, like kill me, shoot me. Um, yeah. So this poem, True Rouge, I'm not gonna read the whole thing out because then um, Richard will get annoyed, and even though I'm dead, I don't want to annoy people. Although it's quite good fun. Um, hold on. Bear with me. Me from the other side. True Rouge. I'll uh, just read out a couple of, a couple of, a couple of key, key lines here. True Rouge. Vers une compréhension tentative. Don't worry if you don't understand it, because it's poetry anyway, so uh, sounds great, even if you don't, you know what I mean? Vers, I'll, I'll do my best, right? Vers, but weirdly and ironically, there's actually an English version, but I couldn't find it. I read this whole fucking poem out on Saturday night in Paris, and then someone said, oh, there's an English version. It's like dumb and dumber. Vers une comp uh, it sounds actually quite cool. Vers une compréhension tentative de l'existence d'une poésie algèbre trop rouge. Étant donné une représentation de représentation monochromatique. Did you get that? Um, TR plus espace plus rouge equal rouge plus espace rouge. TR plus A plus bracket. What's bracket in French? R times two equals R plus ER. I'll skip a few lines for Richard's sake. Au même temps, ce qui est autour de la page de l'espace doit être devenu trop rouge en conséquence de ce qui est logiquement invisible. Invisible. Equations. Simultanément, tout ce qui est trop rouge ou est qui est devenu trop rouge is what my baby wore. Lovely, fantastic, thank you. Well, I'm sure everyone will uh, welcome me and thank you very much for your interview tonight. Mr. Simon Lane, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for your indulgence. Just when you think you don't have enough microphones. Just watch me. Guy Lane. Now, in a moment of um, extraordinary synchronicity, the obituary in The Independent, written by Adrian Dannett, was what first caught my eye that Simon had left us. When I saw that Adrian Dannett had written the uh, obituary, my mind was in turmoil because I remember booking Adrian Dannett for Cabaret Futura in 1980 when he was a 15-year-old poet called Ezra Electric who wore velvet knickerbockers and uh, a, a velvet beret. He looked like uh, a very young Rembrandt, I suppose you could say. 
Uh, and he'd just come from playing William in the Just William series on television. Uh, and Adrian Dannett then was uh, rather precocious, not that he isn't now, but he's uh, rather more mature. Well, no, he's not, actually. Uh, he's older, but not more mature. Um, he said, uh, I, I'm a poet called Ezra Electra, and I'd like to play your cabaret future. And I told him, as I tell all my artists, I'm a terrible payer. He said, oh, that's all right. What do you pay? I said, a pound for each year of your age. I don't do that anymore in case you're getting excited. Um, I had a 72-year-old on me last night. Imagine that. Um, he said, well, I'm 16. I said, I'm not 16. You're 15. Uh, okay. So, so he got 15 quid. But now, I mean, it's more or less what he gets for writing Simon Lane's obituary. But it's a different world. So... No longer Ezra Electric, but poetic to the last, that is Adrian Dannett. We're going to have one more um, performer up here before we uh, adjourn for a cigarette and a little stretch of legs and come back with more talent that you could shake a stick at. So um, I'm not going to say anything about this next 